All right, today we're gonna to discuss a, kind of the aftermath of what had happened last week with our snowstorm. So we pretty much had a record-breaking snowstorm, not in the accumulation that we had, but in the, the damage that it did. The snow was super heavy, super wet, and just caused damage with all the power lines in the area. There was tens of thousands of people out of power for the company that we get our power from. So it ended up taking just over four days to get our power back. So we're gonna discuss some of the things that we had to do and things to consider with the power outage. First of all, we need to worry, since it was the winter, it was a snowstorm, we need to worry about what you're gonna do for heat. So whether you're gonna have backup power to power your furnace or you have a wood stove. It could have been worse because the weather, as you can see now, it doesn't really look like there'd be snow coming or that we just had snow. But if it was colder and it was fairly cold, we gotta worry about heat. So whether you have a wood stove or something like that or propane heaters that are safe to, to run inside or other things like that, you, definitely something to consider. The second thing, you're worrying about food and water. So number one, we're on a septic system without power. What are you doing to, for the, you don't have any water to flush your toilet or two, you need drinking water. So with backup power, depending on how that's set up, you can run your well, which we are in a well, or you can have stored water. So whether you keep that in 55 gallon barrels, old two liter soda bottles, anything like that, you're gonna need water for drinking, you know, sanitation and for flushing your toilet. Lastly, when in consideration there is gonna be your food. If you don't have power, what are you doing to preserve your food that you already have in your freezers and refrigerators? And what are you doing to prepare your food? So we weren't snowed in because the accumulation wasn't that bad after it all settled. So people were still able to get out and uh, get food. However, the closest grocery store to us, they were also out of power. So you couldn't go up there for a, a quick, quick, easy meals because the whole store was shut down. So you were looking at things that are easy to heat, you know, maybe canned food, you know, making sandwiches, things like that, and a way to heat stuff up or cook if you had to. So in our case, I ended up using a simple butane kind of camp stove. You know, so if you had a propane or butane camp stove, you could heat and cook with that. And uh, now we're gonna discuss what we end up doing and what we learned since we did have a generator for backup power. So as you can see here, um, this generator I end up buying used. It uses a Briggs & Stratton motor. It does output uh, 240 volts as well as 120. So we're gonna discuss how we had this set up uh, so we were able to kind of weather the storm better than most people uh, with a little bit of you know thought ahead of time. So the way this is set up, it uses a twist lock connector on the generator. And this is set up with this uh, Reliance Controls uh, plug that goes on the house. So you're using the, the proper, this is rated for 30 amps. So this gets wired in. So this goes in here, twist in, and this locks in place. You wanna make sure that you're using the proper connections here because the main thing that people run into problems with is they don't have the proper box. So they do dumb shit like cutting this end off and putting another male plug and then they back feed you know, regular outlets and things like that. And that's what they call a kill cord or a suicide cord. So you wanna make sure you have the proper connector when you're running your generator. So the way this is set up is we have this box on the outside that feeds to our circuit, uh, circuit panel on the inside of the, well, which is in our basement. And that uses what they call an interlock kit. So what that does, it allows you to either have your generator power or your power from the grid it never allows both to be on at the same time. So what this does is allows you to never backfeed power into the lines. So without that kit, if you had your main panel on when the power was out and you turned on your generator, what you're doing is backfeeding power into the lines. So anybody that's working on the lines um, could be electrocuted. So you, the interlock kit or like a transfer switch, you're gonna want one of those two things set up so you're doing everything safely. So the way this works, since the power was out, I go into the basement, I shut the main panel off, I put the the switch over for the for the for the connection for the interlock and uh, turn that breaker on, and I shut everything, all the rest of the breakers, I shut them all off. I come out, I set the generator up, I plug this in, and then I go in the basement and I'm able to select which breakers that I need that are absolutely crucial. So for us, what we ended up having is I had the furnace and our, uh, our our outdoor boiler powered, as well as all of our refrigerators and our well. 
and then some selected lights just so we had some light in the house. So you can't do everything, but with this generator, we were able to do the stuff that, that was absolutely critical. So in the consideration there, you're gonna wanna look at the power consumption that you're using. So you're gonna wanna look at your appliances or for smaller appliances, you can get uh, what's called a kilowatt. You can plug it in between the outlet and the appliance so you can actually read how much um, the watts that that appliance uses. So when the grid's on, you can kind of keep a tally of like how much maybe your refrigerator and your freezer, uh, how much power they use. So you can kind of keep an eye on the consumption that you're using, and then you can match that up to the generator that you want to buy. So for us, this is a 5,000 watt generator that's the, at the peak, and then I think continuous, it's 4,250. So we stayed well, with, well within the, the range because the other thing to consider, the more that you max that out, the harder the, the motor you can hear when the appliances kick on that it'll really kind of ramp up on, the, on how it runs. So you're gonna be using more fuel. So there, there is a balance there. Just because you have a bigger generator doesn't mean you need to have every light in the house and everything on like normal because you're gonna be eating up a lot of the fuel. Uh, that, that was after we had set up this first plug. When I first bought the house, we had power go out. I, I had a much smaller generator. So what I did here, is I used, it is the same style plug. It uses a regular extension cord that you plug in. So similar to this one, but this is only for 120. So then on the inside of the house, we were able to have the plugs on the inside. So you can still run your extension cords where you want to plug in devices. But since that first time that we had the power go out was in the winter, what I didn't want was to have to run cords through a window or anything like that and then worry about, you know, it's in the winter, you don't want the, the window open. So with something like this, this allows you to get the power in the house without having doors or windows open or anything like that to worry about the cold, the cold coming in. So this is another way to set up just to make it a little more convenient to get the power into the house um, instead of running cords through the, through the window. So um, with the generator, the couple things that you're gonna have to consider is the type of generator that you have. We talked about the watt usage. But this is a gas, a gasoline generator. Um, I did have a family member. They had thought ahead of time. They had their generator. They didn't have any gas. So they were running out in a snowstorm to go to the, to the gas station, which the closest gas station to them were also out of power. So they had to drive over a half an hour each way to go get the gas because they didn't have any fuel stored. So the easiest way um, that I had learned, and I'd never heard anybody else discuss it, uh, Jack Spirico from the Survival Podcast, had the most dead simple way of storing gas. You get one can for every month. So you, this can take you, you know, up, up to a year if you're only buying one at a time. So every month, so now we're into April. So you'd buy a gas can and you'd write the, the number four on it. And you do that every, every month until you have 12 cans. So if you don't need the gas, you know, there's no power outage or storm or anything that you need to use it for. The next year, when it, when it comes to, the, to April, and you didn't use that can, you would take that can, you would pour it into your car or your vehicle, and then go fill that can up. So you really, you're only out for the first year, the can and the fuel, so that's an, an extra, you know, into your expenses that month. And then after that, you're already gonna use that gas for your car anyways, so you're not out any more money. So I had 12 cans of gas stored up. So I had plenty of gas, I was using, um, about a half a gallon per hour and I ran it continuously because our boiler needs continuous power. So I had plenty of gas on hand for the four days that we were out. So unlike a lot of people that were run out of gas, you know, if you had the gas stored, you didn't have to be the one fighting. And it turned out our local gas station, once they got power, they were completely out of fuel, you know, within the first day because so many people were running generators. That way you're not fighting with everybody else to go get gas because you were running short because you only had a can or two. Uh, the other thing to consider, this is a gas generator. There are diesel generators and there are also propane and du dual fuel or tri-fuel. So I do have a 500 gallon tank, uh, propane tank set up. So after going through this experience, um, I will probably upgrade to a dual fuel generator so I can also use our propane tank that uh, just gives us extended time. You know, if the, if the storm was worse, you know, you're talking a week or two, then, you know, you have plenty of fuel. You can actually switch between both. So that's um, some of the considerations for the, for the gas. The other thing that I found out that I'm gonna have to change was uh, the location where I store the generator. 
Um, once the power went out and the, the snow was really coming down heavy, I had a little bit of a tough time getting the generator into position to uh, put the power to the house. So what I'm gonna end up doing is building a small shed that's a lot closer so I can run the cord so the generator is in the position to feed the house without dragging it out of the pole building, especially in, when the conditions are that bad. So there's some considerations there too, your ventilation, everything, um, with getting fresh air into the generator so it runs properly. And some of the newer ones now come with carbon monoxide detectors, so they actually shut themselves off. So some things to consider there, um, that is an upgrade that, that we're gonna make. So those are the, the main things that we end up learning. Um, like I said, we, we fared pretty well just with a little bit of foresight on having the generator, having the hookup. You know, with, with all this, it really wasn't that much money um, to have this all done. I ended up buying that generator at an auction. I got lucky, I paid 75 bucks for that. I think a generator about that size at Harbor Freight, uh, which was also slammed the next day, the, the hardware stores and Harbor Freight, everybody was there lined up to get generators. You know, I think something that size is probably in the $600 range. So if you keep an eye out for something used, and now I see on Marketplace, Facebook Marketplace already, there are a ton of generators for sale. So maybe you can buy one for a couple hundred bucks off that only had a few days worth of, worth of use on it. So having the generator, the fuel, the proper cords too, and making sure it is the proper cord for the, the rating that you have, um, amperage wise and everything like that, and keeping that with the generator. So um, you know, you don't wanna be in the situation where you have the generator and you can't find your cords or don't know where your fuel's at. So keeping all that stuff together. So having this set up, I paid 75 bucks for the generator, all of the parts to get it connected to the house and in the panel. So the interlock kit, the wiring, and this box was about $200. So the investment compared to uh, you know, what you might spend on other things, maybe a little more frivolous, it's a pretty good investment for a couple hundred bucks. So like I said, we were able to keep all of our freezers running so we didn't lose any food. There are some people locally, they couldn't keep their freezers running. You know, like in our freezer, I've got a half a, half a cow, I've got a whole pig, and we have two stand-up freezers. So I mean, you're talking thousands of dollars worth of meat. So you, you got to keep in mind, you know, what your potential losses would be in a situation like this where a couple hundred bucks ahead of time really pay off for not for keeping all the food, not having any losses. So those are just a few things to consider and what, what we learned, you know, we'll do a little bit better next time. Um, but if you take those things into consideration, you know, maybe you guys will fare a little bit better, whether it's a snowstorm like that, or, you know, a tornado, or just a really bad thunderstorm, or a bunch of branches go down and you're out of power. So the, the worst thing for us is that there were so many lines on, I mean, we'll put in a picture of uh, one of the poles. What had happened is the, 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 snow, the snow was so heavy, it was weighing down the power lines and it was causing all, a bunch of the poles to break. So right next to the house, a pole had broken and it was completely on the ground and we're on a, on a road that doesn't have many people that live on here. So we just weren't much of a priority. Like I said, there was tens of thousands of people without power and there was hundreds of poles broken and on the ground. I mean, some were blocking roads and everything else. So we were in better position because of a little bit of uh, preparation ahead of time. So if you guys like this video or have any questions about how we set all this stuff up or anything like that, um, put it in the comments and uh, keep an eye out for more videos coming up. Please like and subscribe. We'll catch you on the next video.